The panel is moderated by Ralph Simon, the founder and chairman of Mobilium Global, the international cool hunters. Ralph is one of the founders of the global mobile entertainment and mobile social media industry, a visionary and a consistent innovator. And is popularly known as the father of the ringtone. His relentless curiosity and search for the world's smartest new mobile journalism and wireless media innovation, creative VR, artificial intelligence, and what grows consumer engagement is multicultural in communities, and that remains his focus. So ladies and gentlemen, let's have a huge round of applause for Ralph Simon. Welcome, Ralph. Our first speaker for the discussion is Rahul Welde, the Executive Vice President Digital Transformation at Unilever, who drives digital transformation across brands and markets, addressing the significant opportunities that digital technology presents. He has helped build capabilities across the digital spectrum, including innovation partnerships, tools and systems in order to better engage with consumers externally while driving the efficiencies internally. Rahul, and every time I say Rahul, I want to say Rahul. Rahul has worked in diverse and challenging assignments across businesses and functions. He has been actively involved in the industry issues, awards, events, and industry bodies, including the World Federation of Advertisers and Mobile Marketing Association. As a guest lecturer at the Harvard Business School, he takes keen interest in developing talent and is a mentor to many young leaders. So ladies and gentlemen, with a huge round of applause, please welcome our first speaker, Rahul. Well, there he is. There he is. Well, there he is. Bad one. Okay, our second speaker is Lindsay Patterson. She is uh, the Chief Client Officer of WPP and is responsible for organic growth and integrated new business along with WPP's 50 global client teams who lead the largest accounts with 40,000 colleagues globally. Previously, Lindsay was uh, the global CEO of Maxis. She was listed for the third time in Britain's top 500 most influential people by Debrits in 2017 and number 34 in the FT Heroes Champions of Women in Business 2018. Well, Heroes is like her and then O's. As a passionate advocate for business leaders to make to take meaningful action to improve gender equality, she launched Walk the Talk, an initiative to help women thrive and progress in their careers. A program now that has been adopted globally by WPP. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for our three profound speakers on stage. Let's welcome Lindsay Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Russo. Hi, Patson, and hi, Mr. Valde. Okay, now we're going to have some action. Namaskaram. Ella Varkum Sukamano. Yeah, baby. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, now we're going to really do some interesting stuff. Adi Poli. Very good. Very good. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, it's incredible to be here in Kochi, in Kerala, in India. People said that when we came, our group here, we should make a point of meeting one of the famous cricketers from Kerala, Srishant. Who remembers that famous catch in the World Cup? Yes. But I said, no, I'd rather meet Mohan Lal. Because Mohan Lal knows about stories and narratives, and that's what we're looking at in terms of creating incredible advertising stories and narratives that stick. So, Namukitu Cheyanam, let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, to kick off today, uh, you've heard the introduction for our uh, eminent speakers, but we have two real global uh, real amazingly experienced uh, advertising professionals that we know you will get some uh, learnings from. And so it gives me very great pleasure to present as our first speaker in this particular session, Mr. Rahul Velde. Give Rahul a big hand, please. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. So, as, as you saw, Sorry. Ralph is not only generous in his introduction, but he's also very entertaining. It's a very tough act to follow, but we'll try. So, uh, this is a great pleasure to be speaking with you, ladies and gentlemen. And what I'm going to do is really, I've got, I think, a dozen odd charts, 12 odd minutes, and canter through just sharing with you some of the insights uh, and nuggets about the future. Now, it's absolutely impossible to talk about the future without risking making wrong predictions and equally really difficult to do it in a short period of time. But I'm going to try and leave you with two or three key nuggets uh, which you will probably find very useful to think about, to reflect on, and possibly even put into action literally within the next uh, few years or so. Now, as we know, we are marketing uh, in a connected world and consumer behaviors are changing very dramatically. Uh, and pretty much we could suggest that if we looked at the past, you could show a TV ad and you know that it would have some kind of an influence and it would lead to a purchase. And very quickly, with the impact of multiple channels, uh, that whole picture has changed very dramatically. Now, for sure, it has changed around the world. And without a shadow of doubt, it has changed in India. And as we know, uh, there is no one place called India. There is India is constituted of many, many different parts of the country. But very much, technology has actually made this impact where anything related to business, marketing, and purchases has been impacted through multiple channels. Now, when we say technology, we could actually be talking about a number of things, uh, you know, right from drones, driverless cars, automation, artificial intelligence, whatever have you. And really, I've tried to distill three or four things, which in my view, uh, and certainly something that we will see, and many marketers believe, and you heard a number of great speakers perhaps talk about similar themes, will actually impact marketing in a very profound way. And therefore, if there's something that needs to stick, it is, I think, around these themes, the themes of personalization, automation, machine learning. And you could all sort of see these as interlinked, and I would actually summarize them as, you know, marketing getting driven by data and data-driven marketing. But I might also add that it's not just data-driven marketing, it is about data-driven marketing at scale, because as you heard some of the previous speakers, that to make a real big impact on business, you don't need to just be cool and have great creative content, but you also need to be able to mount it at scale. So if you were to remember one thing, and it's a cliche, but I'm going to say it again, it is going to be about data-driven marketing at scale. And that's some of the charts that I want to talk to you about. Now, here's an example uh, to bring it, this idea to life of a brand we launched in China last year in partner with Alibaba. Uh, and as you know, you know, Alibaba has made a massive impact in the China ecosystem. Huge amount of uh, uh, sales, uh, consumer interactions, consumer engagement, and pretty much actually a platform which has penetrated right through the pop culture in China. And we had a great opportunity basically on this insight that uh, you know, pollution is something that people are worried about. Pollution is something that people are concerned about. So what if we launched a skin cleansing brand, which was kind of anti-pollution? Uh, and this was done very much in partnership with Alibaba, leveraging the entire ecosystem of Alibaba has. Uh, and a brand created, curated, and then mounted, sold, marketed, pretty much using the Ali system. And when I talk of data-driven marketing, it is not only about communication. It is right from the inside generation to the end, you know, making sure that, you know, the brand, like I said, is launched and you can actually measure the impact way much faster in the internet and the ecosystem. Very simply, for all, those of us in marketing and we've used to market research and focus group discussion, the internet is the world's largest focus group. And how great would it be if we were able to leverage instead of a few consumers and, you know, a panel of a few hundred or a thousand people, tens of thousands of customers who can give you insights into what you need to do, who can actually comment, image instantly give you feedback on whether it's good or bad. And this is a great example of actually co-creating with a partner. I think the concept of data-driven marketing is not just about targeting. It is much bigger than that. And it is about inviting consumers into your business to virtually co-create the business with you. And it's super interesting. You know, the, this is an example from Philippines. And as you can imagine, you know, like most cultures, you know, Philippines is no different. It's a very foodie culture. But at the same time, one of the phenomena happening there is that people are relying more and more on eating outside, more and more on ordering food from outside rather than cooking at home. And we have a business uh, in Knorr, a great food brand, which is all about cooking at home. And this is very much similar to what you can see over here. If you go to a restaurant, you see, you know, quite a large number of Swiggy drivers uh, waiting outside the restaurant, wanting to make deliveries because people are ordering at home. Now, we are interested in making sure that people actually cook more because among everything else, you know, cooking a family meal and for the family to sit together is always very good as well. 
So what we did was using technology, machine automation and learning, uh, we have essentially tried to get through to those people who were wanting to order food through the restaurants. Uh, I, I don't like to use the word interception, but this was really trying to get into the heads and minds and hearts of people who were actively seeking foods from restaurants. What is unique about this kind of example is that as soon as you get the first data signal and the first bit of information on who is doing what, not only are you able to actually engage with them, but the next iteration and the next communication that can you, you can do is highly informed uh, and actually can tailor pretty much to what the person wants because the system understands you know, what the whole person is all about. So there's a degree of personalization which can be brought in with technology and therefore no two people, I mean to make exaggerate the point, no two people get the same message, uh, whether it is in terms of the schedule or the content. Another example is, uh, and it's a slightly different example, this is an award-winning campaign from the UK. And those of you who are familiar with uh, UK and Marmite, this is an iconic brand in the UK. Basically, I think, uh, you know, there's about half the world or half of UK who doesn't like it at all, uh, and like really doesn't like it, as in the taste, and the other half absolutely love it. So the entire campaign was based on facial recognition, and uh, apparently, you know, research suggested that, you know, the idea that you like Marmite or you don't like Marmite is genetic and it cannot be sort of changed. You know, you either love it or hate it. And we thought that it will be great to actually try and see if we can use technology to identify and to be able to uh, uh, excite consumers about this idea and the families, whether they hate it or love it. So this is all about the facial recognition technology. You, you know, have uh, a, a spoon of Marmite on your toast and instantly, you know, the system sort of tells you you're in the hate or the love camp and then obviously you can engage consumers using that. But more important is all of these information flows back instantly uh, and therefore you're able to actually again think of consumers, not at consumers at large, but really break them out into different segments. And more importantly, as you experiment and pilot with these technologies, you can see hundreds of other applications because something like facial recognition becomes very much mainstream. It is not mainstream today, but it will be. Just the way FaceTime was not mainstream when FaceTime was launched. But with FaceTime, you know, and uh, FaceTime has become mainstream. Pretty much everybody who has an iPhone would use FaceTime. We've extensively always been concerned about the environment. And uh, a key insight is that a large number of people, especially in the West and in climates which are different from India, actually wear their clothes once and they're the kind of, you know, it's not really, not very sure whether you want to put it into a wash, but you end up putting it into a wash because you're not sure or it lies on one of the chairs. And this insight is super critical because you're wasting a whole lot of product, a whole lot of water in the process of actually washing clothes, which actually perhaps don't need washing. So what if, you know, and somebody thought, okay, what if, you know, we had a dry detergent, you know, so like almost like a dry shampoo where you just spray the, uh, and spray clean your clothes in an instant, put them on a hanger, and you don't have to go through the process of washing. And I think this is a very powerful insight, but it's also a very powerful idea, which we were able to do pretty much trying to think like a startup and an intact team of a few people, a handful of people getting together, co-creating again the product in the same way on the internet ecosystem, working like a startup, to activate it with consumers, getting some real feedback very quick time. Take a guess, something like this, Right from, you know, the idea to the delivery in market took a fraction of the time what it would otherwise take or a much smaller team, but of course working like a startup, like I said, and most importantly, at a fraction of the budget. So the idea that you have to do big things and you need big money to do big stuff is perhaps right, but it's equally absolutely possible in today's day and world to be able to do something much more swiftly. So this is not only about uh, you know, effectiveness with consumers, very often it is also low cost. And the idea of you have to have big budgets to do big things uh, is uh, you know, just sort of not as true anymore. Another example, and uh, we've, I think, extensively, I'm sure, read, heard, and perhaps even experienced uh, personalization. And per so in the skincare industry, you know, typically speaking, you know, there are segments of what kind of products people want, but it is never ever tailored to a consumer. And the reality is, based on nutrition, based on your lifestyle, how you spend your time, the reality is that everybody has different skincare needs. And at the high end of the market, you can very well imagine that if, you know, there is a very prescriptive, good personalized solution which can take care of your skin, consumers are definitely interested. Again, here with multiple data points, you actually have an assortment of products which are large number in nature. And when I say large, I'm not talking of 50, 100, but as you can imagine, permutations and combinations 
you can actually have access to thousands of products, but the product and the service is tailored absolutely spot on for her. It is tailored based on her lifestyle, you know, her sleeping patterns, and the kind of data that you manage to, on, on the basis of sort of the exchange, actually get from the consumer. Now, how many in the audience actually had, uh, have bought something on e-commerce? Right, pretty much quite a large group. If I asked this question uh, a year ago, probably the number would be half, right? How many in the audience have bought anything which is highly personalized, personalized, made for you? Right, a handful of hands. And I can guarantee you that fast forward one year later, we're in the same room and ask the same question, the number of hands which go up to the fact that they've bought a personalized product, something that is actually tailored for them, made for them, something that has been driven by a deep understanding of what the consumer is all about, is going to be at least 5x, 4x of the number of hands that go up. The point is that the future, and technology actually enables us to do this, is to just understand consumers better, A, so that as marketers we can serve them better, and guess what? Because we understand them better and they actually, you know, uh, get access to better product services and solutions, they are also in a better place. Now, naturally, to make all this happen, you have to begin to put some infrastructure in place, you have to begin to put in place new capabilities and activate them, and that's absolutely an important part of the way we see the future. And there are just three examples of what we call Unilever Studios, a Unilever Foundry, which engages with startups, and the People Data Center, which is a capability that enables us to actually get hold of uh, all this kind of knowledge and capabilities. Super important, because you cannot do this uh, just by sort of imagining the stuff, and it is actually the business of very strong technology and process capabilities. And indeed, you know, you keep progressing along the journey and the process of setting it up, digital hubs, you know, intact teams coming together to make sure that all of this is happening in rapid fashion. Because one of the biggest changes that has happened in marketing and technology is the speed, right? We could wait, potentially, previously, to launch a campaign, then wait a few weeks or months for some kind of results. Uh, and now, however, you know, pretty much, you know, real time in a couple of days, a couple of weeks, uh, you have the entire results of how good it is going and you can make the changes. I want to show you a short example of a great project which our team in India did, which leverages the power of uh, insights in real time and actually focuses attention on where impact can be maximized. Obviously, as you maximize impact in a particular way, you're also able to manage your costs more efficiently and it becomes a highly targeted, in this case, not targeted an individual, but targeted with a geography. Uh, and as you can imagine, in all these examples that I have given, if there were two things that you were to take out, one is, of course, technology, and that's a given, and the second is partnerships. I have, you know, through all the examples, always one is partnership with consumers, with partnership with Alibaba, partnership with some of our agencies. And indeed, in this case, it was partnership with Google, which enabled us to do a program which was actually quite impactful. Let's look at a short video which shows what it was about. As the system, and in this case it is led through Google searches, was that the system gets the data signals from what's actually happening and how many people are searching for a particular type of, whether it's a disease or a virus or a flu or whatever it might be, the system automatically triggers off the responses. And therefore, I think it's quite cool because you actually are able to drive this marketing car, or in this case, sort of media and communication cars, hands-free, because the system has sort of decided that, you know, now is the time that I want to actually begin to make an impact without waiting for a very large cycle of, oh, you know, what's the analysis, what's going on. And the reality, as we know in the Google world and with the search world or in the technology world, that a lot of this is happening real time. Now, naturally, to make all this happen, we have to think of... Uh, we have to think of the most important asset, and I've spoken about data, technology, but we can't complete the conversation about talking about the most important asset, and that's the people. And the people is really important. Uh, this is all about skills and talent. In the earlier world, and even today, we take a great deal of uh, 
thinking about saying scale leverage. You know, if you're big, you have leverage because you have scale, and that is absolutely true. But if I can suggest that in the future, and even today, it is not only about scale leverage. Scale is important, absolutely, make no mistake about it. But it is also about skill leverage. Do you have the skills in the organization, the culture and the leadership, and the real core skills to make all of this happen? Because remember, to make a lot of what I said is actually a technical matter. It's an expertise, right? So therefore, how do we impact skills? And how do we actually leverage skills is a very important leadership dimension. Now, our business is really not about just selling products, and I think you've heard uh, quite a lot about the idea of doing good. And it is absolutely important that we do all these right things uh, we make sure that we are leveraging data, we are understanding consumers better, we are serving their needs better, but quite obviously, we have to do better than that. And we have to make sure that you know, it is not about just uh, making good business, but it's also about doing good. Let me then wrap it up, uh, and just sort of in the interest of time and otherwise, I'm sure we'll have some great questions and discussions. But just to stay on course, let me wrap it up with an excellent film which talks about how, as a company, we believe, and therefore we believe that in order to make any future happen, whether it's in marketing, digital transformation, otherwise, we must, as a society, have the future. And I think you heard extensively Paul talk about it earlier in the morning, about how it is super vital for, the, for us as a community of advertisers, as marketers, to not just think about the products and services we sell, but think a little more. So let me play you the video which brings us to life about a thought which is presented by Unilever. Can we have the next video, please? एक दिन हमारे गांव में किसी ने नहाने का सावर रख दिया। आधे गांव ने पानी पी लिया और एक शहर वाले का नहाना अभी खत्म ना हुआ टाटा लिटिल गुड uh, I'm sure that many of you have seen this film before. Hopefully many of you have. Perhaps some of you have also saw, seen it at the event. Uh, but I had absolutely no hesitation in showing this to you again because it is such an awesome film. And thanks to our partners, to Gilby, who actually crafted some brilliant ideas which I, not only, like I said, you know, talk about great products, but in this case, uh, move the game forward. So ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great pleasure to speak with you, uh, to share with you some of the interesting uh, insights which I certainly think uh, are going to be impacting our industry, like I said, not in the far distant future, but almost in the next couple of years, uh, this year, next year, and the year beyond. And I'm going to hand over to Lindsay then to say a few things, or perhaps Ralph to introduce Lindsay in the same entertaining fashion that he did. Cool. Go for it. Thank you. Rahul, thank you very much. Rahul, I can only say uh, you a tip-top hair. <laughs> very, very good. Ekdom jakas. Very, very good. Thank you. That's right. No, but I mean, you look at what they did in Rajasthan. I mean, just such an interesting ad that really sparked off a national conversation. And that's what you want to do in today's world where your advertising really has to have its own waves and its own flow of water and ideas to your audience. And now it gives me very great pleasure to present our next speaker, someone who is a true, true advertising professional. Uh, she has a really distinguished background. She led uh, the ad company Maxis for over a decade. And in around 2018, she was appointed as the Chief Transformation Officer at WPP. She is now uh, in a very significant position of being the Chief Client Officer at WPP, a very, very important role. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome now Lindsay Patterson. Thank Lindsay. You. Thank you, Ralph. 
I hate introductions. It's always really embarrassing being on stage and hearing your name um, talked about. But I'm really uh, delighted to be here today. So quick question. Do I like or hate Marmite? Let's, we don't need AI. You can just look at my expression. What do you think, Rahul? I love Marmite. It's delicious. I think I love it because it's so salty. It's a fantastic product. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about how organizations like WPP are helping businesses transform. So as, you, as you've heard from the start of the day, disruption is affecting everybody in every business and every brand. Perhaps no more, uh, more so than here in India, but with disruption comes opportunity. And in an economy where you're growing at 7% and with an ad spend growth, the highest anywhere in the world at 14%, it's a great opportunity for us all to grow and to thrive in that environment. Um, so you may have noticed that WPP itself has undergone some significant transformation. So let me quickly talk about that. Many of you would have been here yesterday to hear Sir Martin Sorrell talk very eloquently about WPP in the past and his new venture um, moving forward. But we have a new CEO in Mark Reed, who actually was here in uh, India last week in Jaipur at our unconference stream with many colleagues and clients and media partners. Um, and he has a very clear vision for WPP as we move forward, which is to be a creative transformation company. And each of those words is really important, but perhaps particularly the fact that we're called one company. So WPP is one company of 130,000 individuals and colleagues around the world. We're not a parent group and we're not a holding group. We are one organization where clients can come to get the best of that talent. I think really importantly, Mark has created and has instilled and is encouraging a culture We've never really had a culture before at WPP, but we have a culture of collaboration. And I think the word that I will use most over the next 10 minutes is the word of collaboration. And last but not least, um, we have uh, three values at WPP. They are values and they are behaviors that bind us together and motivate us. And when we are at our best, we are open, we are optimistic, and we are extraordinary. And that's what we aspire to be. Um, so just briefly, I'm sure you know uh, much about WPP, but we're proud partners um, around the world. We've worked with 369 of the Fortune 500, or 30 of the Dow Jones, 30, 66 of the FTSE 100, six of the most valuable brands in China. And here in India, we work with 44 of the largest 75 or 75 most valuable brands here in India. And it's a mix, really, of about 50% local brands and 50% multinationals and brands come to WPP when they either need to grow and when they're new businesses looking for growth or perhaps when they're established businesses looking to reinvent themselves for the future. And we all know this word gets used a lot, disruption or transformation, but we know that the world of our clients is changing and we're experiencing uh, what the World Economic Forum has called for two years now the fourth industrial revolution, which is of course a technological revolution which has implicitly changed the way we live and the way we work. We're all experiencing massive amounts of disruptive competition, so even WPP itself. So we have new brands, new competitors, local competitors, direct to consume competitors, who mean we have to make disruption a business imperative. There's mega amounts of data. There was a great talk on this earlier, but there's tension between the amounts of data available and what we can do with that data and concerns over security and privacy. There's a whole ton of technology, the key driver in the Industrial Revolution. And I think what's interesting about that technology is it requires us to behave perhaps in a different way. It requires an openness and it requires, again, that word of collaboration. And perhaps in the past, where many of our clients and many organizations like WPP have competed, actually we now seek to collaborate. And last but not least, the uh, theme for the IAA this year, um, brand purpose or Dharma. I, I can't speak as well as, uh, as Ralph can, but Dar Dharam or brand Dharma, I think is more important than ever in giving your business a competitive edge, in giving you sustainable business growth, and I think really importantly, attracting talent to come and work for you. So our job is to help our clients change and to help them grow. And we have four pillars in ways that we think WPP can help do that. So through communications, through experience, through commerce, and through technology. So I'm going to start with communication. 
which is the traditional parts of WPP. It's what you will know as best for. So by communication, I mean advertising, media, PR, etc. And we still think that communication, those traditional parts of advertising and communication are really, really important. And breakthrough creativity can really help transform businesses. The example I want to briefly show you is for Budweiser. And it's connected to the idea of brand purpose. So Budweiser is committed to renewable energy. It's committed to having 100% of the electricity that uh, brews its beer to be renewable in the near future. And it wanted to try and communicate this to its consumers in a way that was authentic, that felt like it would resonate with consumers. Because if, you, if you're trying to communicate that your business has transformed and nobody understands you, it's a bit like a, a tree falling in a wood and, and nobody can hear you. So where should you play that communication? How should you do it? So we chose to launch this um, spot in the Super Bowl. So the world's biggest stage still for advertising. And you would normally expect the kind of communication in that environment to be a group of mates drinking buds, laughing and talking about the soccer game. But we produced something quite different that we're very proud of. I think that's spectacular work. And you can see it's beautiful. It uses the traditional aspects of Budweiser. The Clydesdale horses are a bit like Bollywood superstars, actually. They're very hard to get to if you're in an ad. And it was beautiful. It was done in one take. So you can imagine how much that cost to shoot. And of course, using Bob Dylan uh, wasn't cheap either. But I think it does a fantastic job of conveying a new brand purpose with the values of the, the brand from old. So that's communication. Uh, the second area that we now um, think about our offer is in um, experience. So how do we connect and how do we engage with consumers? How do we connect brands and consumers in a way that's more active than perhaps we've done in the past? So the example you can see um, behind me is for Eurostar. Has anyone been on Eurostar? I'm looking now, else. you've been on Eurostar, hello. Uh, so Eurostar is a train that connects London to Paris um, and therefore it has to go uh, in a tunnel under the sea. And the most commonly asked question uh, that most people ask, particularly children, is will I get to see the fish? Sadly, you don't get to see the fish. It's actually quite a dull experience. You go into a tunnel, it's just completely dark, and it's all a bit disappointing. But wouldn't it be wonderful if you could see the fish? So one of our agencies created a, um, a virtual reality app. You just download it, on, download it on your smartphone, pop it into a Google Cardboard, and suddenly you are transported into a world that looks a bit more like Finding Nemo. And actually, in a category where Eurostar is competing with air travel and with ferries, actually making the journey as exciting and magical as the destination um, meant this was a hugely successful campaign and one we're really proud of. Um, the third area is commerce, and we're deliberately calling it commerce, not e-commerce, because of course to succeed in today's world, you need an omni-channel strategy. So work we would do with Unilever and many of our clients looks at bricks and clicks, not just bricks and mortar, and it doesn't separate those two. But the example you'll see behind me again is to highlight work perhaps you know WPP uh, less well for. So this is um, the merger of Ux and Net-A-Porter meant we created the world's largest online luxury sales channel. So this now operates in uh, 180 markets with 11 languages. It has a 20% market share of the luxury um, uh, closed category and we transact um, an order um, every four seconds for that business. And finally, technology itself, which is the great enabler. And I guess it's the differentiator between being someone who is merely disrupted to being the disruptor and to winning. And I think we have changed our perspective on technology and how we work uh, with technology partners. We don't think we need to own loads of technology. We just think we need to partner really well and be deeply expert with the major technology platform. So here I think scale does make sense. We are the largest uh, um, agency that works with Mercato. We are the largest agency partner for Salesforce. We are the largest agency partner with Facebook, uh, Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba. Um, and Google is one of our largest clients as well as us being the largest spender. So I do think scale is important in technology. But I also think collaboration is even more important and how we work with and how we partner with each of those technology providers and we don't compete with them. So that's the area, that's how WPP is thinking about the four capabilities of how we want to help 
businesses transform. Here in India, there's a lovely picture of Srini, who is our country manager. So WPP is organized primarily around clients and then companies, fewer bigger companies, and then uh, last but not least, countries. So Srini has his own five-point plan on how he is transforming and getting India, uh, WPP India, future ready. Starting with my favorite word, as you can see, that of collaboration. So ensuring that our companies and our CEOs are truly working together. Secondly, thinking about how we can be agile. So we're going to be opening WPP campuses in Delhi and in Mumbai. And that's a trait that we're doing all over the world. Um, third area is um, when we buy companies, and in the past we've certainly bought a lot of companies at WPP, we're trying to be very focused on our M&A strategy. So Srini will be buying uh, agencies or partnering with people who are focused on those high growth areas of commerce, technology, and experiences. So the last three agencies we bought were in the areas of mobile marketing, digital content, and social influence. Of course, we need to be people-centric. We have over 12,000 people that work for WPP India. It's one of our top markets around the world, 20,000 if you include our associate companies. So thinking about how we can get, how WPP India is really a talent agency that clients can come to. And last but not least, again, back to brand purpose or Dharma, which is really important to WPP India. And here we've chosen as our purpose to focus on education at both ends of the spectrum. So we work with underprivileged schools, um, in and around Mumbai, uh, we have a foundation that works really closely with them in areas like robotics and, and coding and musicianship. Um, and we partner with the ISD School of Communications to bring in graduates into our, our organization. So I'm going to end with, I was going to say two pieces of work, but actually it will be one because Rahul and I were duplicating. But two pieces of work we're proud of from India. So as I said, we have a mix of local and multinational clients, but here in India we helped launch the Netflix brands. And this was a great piece of communication by Glitch, one of our newer agencies, that really thought about how to use communi communication in a locally nuanced way. So uh, Narcos is a fantastic series. Um, uh, it's about a drug baron called Pablo Escobar, but to try and appeal to startup friendly India, uh, Pablo was positioned as an entrepreneur, which I think is a rather generous way of describing but I guess it does make sense. He was just being entrepreneurial in a way that could throw him into jail. Um, and it was incredibly successful uh, as a way of helping to launch that whole service into India. But more importantly, of course, we use a mixture of data and technology to try and target the right Indian households with the shows that will work well for them. And I was going to end by talking about Lifeboy, which is the example, and actually Rahul has showed you a video, but it's work that we are incredibly proud of because actually it's people within our organizations that take unstructured data sets from the government, that clean it up, that triangulate that with the telco companies here to ensure that we had a campaign that was able to predict the outbreak of 21 different diseases in rural areas around India give them the message about washing their hands with Lifebuoy to prevent germs that resulted in 178,000 fewer deaths and had the side benefit of improving in rural India Lifebuoy's market share and brand preference. And the phrase I love that Unilever use all over the world, and Hindustan Unilever is our, uh, we're proud to say, is our largest partner here in India, is that of compassionate capitalism. And I think that's a great example. So with that, I'm going to turn to Ralph uh, and join um, Rahul for some Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. So ladies and gentlemen, people have been saying that the advertising industry is going through a period of structural decline. But of course, as we know, and particularly here at the World Congress, that is not correct. We're going through structural change and not necessarily structural decline. Budgets are potentially growing, the reach is growing, and the way that one reaches one's audience grows. And I was so glad you showed the, the Netflix campaign because if you uh, saw this campaign in India with this incredible mix of outdoor, television, online, uh, social, uh, it clearly helped to reinforce the brand and whoops, get so excited about advertising. <laughs> but the other thing is what, uh, what you showed with Lifeboy and uh, Rahul, what you'd expressed with Lifeboy, just showing how this whole new notion of social responsibility as a core element of your advertising structure is absolutely essential. So, Lindsay, a question for you. Um, people are talking about the fact that WPP certainly with Mark Reed taking over towards the end of last year, 
and yourself being appointed as the chief client officer, where you've got 54 account leaders that report to you in terms of all of your uh, key and various accounts. Um, but uh, the thing is this, in terms of the way that you are, are developing this notion of radical evolution mm -hmm. and radical change, transformative change, that gives you both speed and creativity. Just speak a little bit about this whole notion of radical evolution. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, again, you could say there's maybe a tension between those two words. So to be radical sounds like you're going to change absolutely everything, but evolution is a much softer phrase than revolution. And actually, we quite like the tension between the two because WPP is a very successful business. So we don't want to throw everything out, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need to evolve what we are doing, but I do think we need to be radical about it. Um, and I think we see our clients experience such huge amounts of disruption and transformation. It would be remiss of us to not think that we needed to do some of that ourselves. So here's an interesting thing. I'd love to just get your view on it because this is a problem that every advertising professional faces, loss or gain of new clients. So literally a couple of weeks or around about the time that you were appointed the chief client officer, um, WPP loses parts of your American Express business that you'd had for 20 years. You lose one of uh, some business of PepsiCo's Gatorade you had for eight years. Um, you lose some of Ford business. Um, you can't blame me for all no, of no, these. No, 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 I'm not blaming, I'm just saying. <laughs> it's like a is, litany of... This, this is what the happens. The timing was, yeah, fortuitous or not. <laughs> the opposite of fortuitous. Some clients decide to stay and some clients yeah. decide to go, but then yeah. equally, uh, you got some great gains because uh, you won Volkswagen, you won uh, Mondelez. Yep. It's a very important, uh, big cluster of brands. You won Distel. Yep, in South and, Africa. Yep. And you won Newell brands. And this is all just over the last few weeks. Uh, yeah, I mean, you win some and um, you lose some. So, you know, I think our business is tough at the moment, but we're undergoing dramatic change and we're gearing up to make sure that we are much more client-centric and agile and nimble um, for the future. So we do, we have to not agonize over losses. Um, exactly. Sometimes I think because WPP is so big and it's been so successful for such a long time, sometimes we capture the headlines and often negative headlines are more sexy or exciting than positive headlines, but we have experienced some great growth. We're a very successful company, but we will change and we do need to evolve. Um, we have our results uh, a week tomorrow, and actually within that, I'm sure Mark will be able to talk about more wins we've had from the start of the year, but I won't mention them yet in case I'm not allowed to. No, but the point is that th this is just the nature of modern, yeah. the modern advertising industry and business, and you have to go with the flow or alternatively come up with something where your creativity and your technology mm -hmm. will help lead. We have to creatively transform ourselves as well as doing that for our clients. Exactly. So Rahul, here's a question for you. I hear a lot, and particularly just observing the way that Unilever works its global business, you've developed something that is called the 5C framework. What is the 5C framework? Right. So 5C framework is essentially the framework with which we approach marketing in the connected world. It's uh, got consumers and consumer journeys at the center. I explained the, in the example of how consumer journeys are changing, so we really want to understand that deeply. And then around the consumers at the center, we've got content, we've got connections, we've got communities we want to build and we want to power commerce. Uh, so really it is a framework which enables us to think of holistically how we will address marketing in the connected world. And there are multiple times, uh, you know, there are very many different dimensions of this. In some cases, you know, we have to dial up the commerce because the e-commerce is changing very rapidly. In some cases, it is about content. But at the heart of it is always a consumer. And often I'm asked this question when we think of the 5C framework or uh, digital marketing that, you know, are you a digital first company now? Because my job is all about digital transformation or are we a mobile first company? And the simple answer to this is that we have to be a consumer first company. And we try to bring that to life absolutely by having this framework which is constructed around what consumers really journeys are all about and what consumers are doing. So no, another part of this strategy is that you've got data centers in many locations enabling modern technology and systems to give you that highest, fastest rate of data that you can then use to stimulate your decision making. Would that be an accurate reflection? Yes, absolutely. I think we, I, I wouldn't use the word fastest though. I would say faster than before. 
and it can be much faster than where we are today. I think this velocity, and you know, when we talk of data, we talk of data very loosely, but there is high quality and deep data, there is, you know, sort of fast data, there is slow moving data. So data is a very uh, generally used term, but the reality is that we build the capability now to understand these different dimensions because, the, you know, the truth is that you don't need to take all decisions super fast. Uh, so I, I, I think I use the word fast with a caution that, of course, it has to be fast, but it has to be fit for purpose fast, not just fast for the sake of it. And I think that's the beauty of the data, both in terms of the depth and the richness that we can get equally, the speed. And speed is certainly enabled by technology. Tell us about uh, what is U Studios and your Ultra, or you call it your U Studios. What exactly is that? Yeah, I think Ultra and U Studios are again two fundamental capabilities we've built. U Studios is the content production engine because one of the realities of the uh, new connected world is that we need much more content than we needed before. And this has only continued to grow, right? I mean, just in terms of a statistic, earlier on an average, a consumer would see 50, 60, 100 ads. And now, in the, you know, with the sort of number of media channels that consumers engage with, that number is in thousands. It's in fact, you know, just yesterday I read, it's of the order of some 5,000 ads that consumers are exposed to. So you just don't know. You have so much of content being thrown at you. So to make high quality content, to do it at scale, because you need thousands of pieces of content to be produced, uh, U Studio is a fundamental capability we've tried to build, which produces great content at scale. Ultra, on the other hand, which you referred to, is a programmatic trading desk, and that's to do more with uh, the programmatic trading that we do in media. Uh, and Ultra is, uh, you know, really the shorthand for Unilever uh, trading desk, uh, you know, with which we do programmatic digital advertising. So what Rahul has just said kind of touches in with your WPP thinking about having an omni-channel, but also this, this dilemma for advertisers about having to have thousands of pieces of material, of content, of ads, I mean, and you've got to basically govern all of this traffic, the media traffic, the media buying. This is one of the big challenges of running a, an operation like you do. Yeah, and I think what we um, will do um, is we, we actually have here in India, in uh, um, Bangalore, we have a huge production hub for Wonderwin MSC, and we are offshoring more of our capability actually with Hogarth. So we know that we have to be better, fast, I will use the word fast, but fast, agile, quick, and efficient in how we are helping with transcreation and with multiple assets. I think what's interesting is the highest growth area, one of the highest growth areas within that is probably the MSC um, part of Wonderman, which is using lots of different types of technologies to ensure that the advertising that we serve is super accurate and tie that into the programmatic media buy. So how is different amounts of uh, how, how is the content infused by the learning from media and vice versa and connecting those things together structurally can be quite hard. Uh, technically, it's harder than just saying, uh, you know, stick an API on it. Um, but that's what we have to do for most of our clients is we, we, we still do. Actually, Martin spoke about his company not doing big pieces of breakthrough communication or tentpole communication. We still do that, and we still see that's a very healthy part of our business, and we're proud to have had, we had six ads running in the Super Bowl um, a few weeks ago, but we also recognize as well that we need to help our clients with the multiple um, formats and connecting that into the media spend as well. So we, we do both. Very, very interesting, all of this. And the fact that the, the two of you work quite closely together because obviously you represent uh, Unilever's yeah. business, so you sharing some of these <laughs> problems of how you deal with speed, how you deal with the, the thousands of uh, ads that you have to create. I mean, this is as much of a challenge as the creative uh, direction that you want to take a brand or a product or a style or even the corporate identity of Unilever itself at that retail, at the merchandising level and so forth? Yeah, but I, I see it, uh, I, firstly, I don't see it as a problem or a challenge. I think for us in the marketing industry, whether you're an advertiser, whether you're an agency, whether you're in the media business, this is the most exciting time, right? It also, is. I think this idea of making thousands or hundreds of pieces of contest does not mean that we don't make hero films. I showed you actually a beautiful film, which I would call is a fantastic one unit of great piece of content. So we have to do both. And I think therefore, you know, 
from a marketer's perspective, this is one of the most exciting times that we yeah. can be in. And forget the idea there's a challenge and a problem and all that. Actually, I say bring it on, you know, throw it as much as you can at whether you are and you then find solutions. And one of the biggest assets that we have is the human creativity. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, our, and our ability to find, uh, you know, quick solutions to whatever is thrown at us. And that's, I think, the power of marketing, the power of the advertising industry. And, you know, all of us here in the room are actually a part of that in a very big way. So, ladies and gentlemen, yes, give him that. That's a good idea. He, he loves it. That's what sails his boat. We're optimistic about I think we're all optimistic. We wouldn't we're be on all. stage if we weren't optimistic about the future. And just to build on Rahu's point, I think we would think about that there are macro pieces of communication that you might want to call water cooler or Super Bowl moments, pieces of content that are emotional, that connect, that drive the long term, that have resonance, and they start to drive... Uh, brand equity over a longer time period. And we still need to create those pieces of communication. And then you have the micro-targeted, so one-to-one, -one, personalized, hyper-efficient. And we just need to think about how both of those work and that they're not in complete isolation. So how does the macro and how do the micro work together? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we could go on. Unfortunately, we have uh, run out of time, but I want to say a huge thank you to you, Rahul, for um, your wisdom and your guidance, and Lindsay, to you with all of your cumulative professional experience and your insight into where things are going. Just such a great treat to have you all to, yeah, we'd like to say to both of them, uh, Otiri Nandi. Otiri Nandi, come on. Bahut Danyavad Shandas, thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, here at the World Congress uh, of the IAA, a great, great thanks to both of you. Thanks Thank for being you. with us, and good luck, good hunting, and good creativity, and faster speed. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Ralph Simon, and we love being with you. Oh, God, thank you so much. What a lovely conversation. And oh my God, you are just gorgeous and adorable all in the same breath. Thank you. By the way, because, you know, Rusha has been so kind teaching you all Malayalam words, I just know one Malayalam word which I think you can actually say back because it was such a great session. And the word is Adipoli. Right? So can you say Adipoli, all of us? That's what we're talking about. Good job, guys. Also, uh, I want to know if you're free uh, for the next two hours. Maybe take my place. You're so good. <laughs> Everyone loves you. Everyone loves you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to invite on stage Mr. Raymond So, the Chairman AFA, to present Mr. Welde, Ms. Patterson, and Mr. Simon a memento of gratitude. Please welcome Mr. So. Hi, Mr. So. I literally went like Raymond uh, So, So. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was a part of my sentence. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much. So, so, thank you so much for doing this. May I request the three of you to kindly take center stage. I hope you really, really love the mementos from Titan. They are ceramic watches, the thinnest in the world, if I may add. 